Al Ghuli owes its existence to one thing above all others, gold. Second in importance to gold is water. Due to the importance of the first and the lack of the second, a pipeline was constructed from Mandering in the hills near Perth, mostly uphill, 560 kilometres to Kalgoorlie. This was done in the early years of the 20th century, and water began flowing in 1903. Charles Yoverton O'Connor was the engineer behind the project, and it's mostly to his genius and hard work that we owe thanks for the success of this incredible infrastructure project. Sadly, he did not live to see the completion of the project. A cruel and unjust press conducted an unrelenting campaign of lies and slander against him. O'Connor, under huge pressure from the project alone, eventually could take no more and took his own life in what can only be described as one of the greatest tragedies that has ever taken place in Western Australia. This great man was responsible not only for the Kalgoorlie pipeline, but for other projects that were vital to the state's development, such as the rail network and Fremantle Harbour. There should be a special place in hell reserved for those who needlessly drove him to his death. The availability of water on the goldfields ensured its future, and the pipeline was extended to many other towns, thus ensuring their development as well. Before the discovery of gold and the arrival of the pipeline, the first European to explore the area was Henry Maxwell Lefroy in 1863. It wasn't until 30 years later that a party comprising of Tom Flanagan, Dan O'Shea and Paddy Hannan discovered gold at Mount Charlotte. It seems likely that Flanagan was the one who actually found the first nuggets. But since Hannon was the one selected to travel back to Coolgardy and register the find, it was his name that was to be remembered and celebrated as the finder of gold in the Kalgoorlie area. In fact, we can't even find photographs of the other two men, despite their obvious importance to the story of gold. Flanagan and O'Shea are barely remembered today, and it's Hannon's name that graces Kalgoorlie's main street and his statue that sits on the corner by the town hall. A huge gold rush ensued, but the main problems were isolation and the lack of water. At one point, water was costing more than gold. Some mines sank shafts below 200 feet and found not gold, but water. This turned out to be a good thing, as water was so scarce that one mine regularly sold 25,000 gallons a day. Another precious commodity on the gold fields was wood, and it took about one tonne of wood to extract every two tonnes of ore. Wood cutting was, after mining, the second most important occupation on the gold fields. Two strikes by woodcutters in 1908 and 1916 brought the mines to a close for some time. The woodcutters were asking for an increase of three pence per tonne, and when 3,000 miners had been out of work for nearly three weeks, the mines gave in and the woodcutters got their increase. While it was Hannan and Company who discovered the alluvial gold, it was William George Brockman, who actually arrived quite late on the field, who discovered the greatest concentration of gold. George Brockman and his partner Sam Pierce were dismissed by the miners as inexperienced new chums. They came from South Australia, sent over by a syndicate of ten people to search for gold on the new fields. According to the old hands, they were looking in all the wrong places. Where there was lots of ironstone, when everyone knew that quartz was the mother of gold. Pierce stated that within half an hour of first looking for gold, he managed to locate some small nuggets, but the men were looking for something much more substantial. They relocated their campsite to an area that had by this stage been untouched. In Pierce's words, there were big blows of iron, 
and he found a big north and south formation of quartzite and iron, enclosed in diorite walls with gold freely showing in every stone broken or picked up. The men were almost in the middle of what is today known as the Golden Mile, and their find was to become the Ivanhoe Mine. Brockman brought out crushed ore that to the naked eye showed little or no signs of gold, but when assayed, it was found to have eight ounces to the tonne. Despite making enough to retire comfortably on, Sam Pierce was to follow the trail of gold for the rest of his life. He never again found the kind of ground he discovered in Kalgoorlie, and at the age of 80, he was still living in a tent, working a small lease in South Australia. He died in the Adelaide Hospital in 1932. Despite Pierce and Brockman's discovery of the major gold-producing area in Kalgoorlie, it was Hannon that was to be remembered as the discoverer of gold. If you visit Kalgoorlie, then you should make time to pay a visit to the Museum of the Goldfields. Entry is free, and you can learn a lot about the area and its history, as well as catching a lift up into that big head frame and get a wonderful view over the town. There are displays of the area's native fauna, as well as all sorts of memorabilia from the past. In the Below Ground Vault, you can see the largest public display of the state's gold bars and nuggets. In a darkened room, there is a unique display of old trade union banners. The banners were mostly hand-painted on either canvas or silk, and those on display are kept from exposure to light in order to help preserve them. This part of the museum is actually what was once the British Arms Hotel. The hotel is believed to be the narrowest in the Southern Hemisphere. The museum opens daily from 10am to 3pm, except on the usual public holidays like Anzac Day, Christmas Day, etc. Kalgoorlie today is a large modern town with all the facilities you would expect. It's come a long way from its origins as a harsh frontier town with almost no water on the edge of civilization. The name Kalgoorlie has several possible origins. It may be derived from the Aboriginal word Galgurli or Kalkurla meaning silky pear, or it may mean dog chasing kangaroo. It could also mean three lines shaped like a Y. Not sure where that one comes from, but uh, we did find that one in one of our reference books. It could even have originated with the Aboriginal word Galgooliganya, which means water from trees near the meeting of tracks. The town has seen hard times in the past, when gold prices fell and mining became all but unprofitable. Mining's always been a tough game, 
and miners have always worked and played hard. The town has been known for both the number of hotels and the number of brothels catering to miners' needs. Currently, gold production is about 70% of Australia's total output. At its height, it's believed that Kalgoorlie reached a population of about 30,000 people, and there were estimated to be no less than 93 pubs and at least eight breweries. Mining is a dangerous occupation, not just because of rock falls, dangerous gases, explosives and accidents with machinery. In 1925, silicosis was finally recognised as a condition caused by the dust inhaled by miners. A Workers' Compensation Act was proclaimed in Parliament and miners affected were no longer made to work underground. Lung damage from the dust, especially from quartz, led to other complaints like tuberculosis. As TB is infectious, it readily spread from one miner to the next. The First World War saw mining decline in Kalgoorlie, and by the 1920s, the costs associated with extracting gold were steadily rising. Mines across the gold fields were closing, and even big mines were processing much less ore. As bad as it was, Kalgoorlie was far better off than other Australian gold fields, and by the end of the 1920s, it was still producing about 80% of all Australia's gold. When the Wall Street crash triggered the Great Depression of the 1930s, Kalgoorlie was one of the few places that benefited. The gold price soared, and Kalgoorlie flourished while the rest of the world floundered. In 1931, the Golden Eagle, a nugget weighing 70 pounds, was discovered and seemed to hail the success of Kalgoorlie even in the midst of a worldwide recession. Tension between miners of English background and those of Italian and Yugoslav origins boiled over in 1934, after a young man named Jordan was killed after an altercation with an Italian barman named Claudio Mataboni. A full-blown riot started, and many businesses and homes were looted or destroyed. At least two deaths were said to have occurred during the Troubles. The Second World War saw another slump in mining, as miners enlisted and went overseas to fight. Some returned after the war, but the heart seemed to have gone out of the area, and a slow and steady decline was to follow. Worse followed in the 1950s with the Korean War, triggering high inflation, and the cost of mining became almost prohibitive. By the 1970s, most of the mines had closed down and the few that remained open were reworking old ground. At the same time, nickel was in demand, and miners were moving away to mines at Cambelda. In 1973, the last two surviving mines merged, and though the price of gold rose in 1974, inflation kept mining costs high. By 1975, it looked as though the gold fields were finished. The gold subsidy of 1954 had been abolished and hundreds of miners had been laid off. The Australian newspaper reported on September 6, 1976, Kalgoorlie died, aged 83, last week. Then, when it looked as though all was lost, an investment of $8 million and the creation of the Kalgoorlie Mining Associates in March 1976 breathed new life into the area. Fate, it seemed, was against the deal, and the gold price continued to fall. Just when the last mine was about to close, the Australian dollar was devalued, and the gold price soared by $22 an ounce. By 1980, gold was at record values, and even low-grade ore from Mount Charlotte, the last surviving mine, was returning a profit, and shareholders got a dividend for the first time in 11 years. The Golden Mile, actually an area 4 kilometres long, 1 kilometre wide and 1.5 kilometres deep, was reborn. It was about that time that Alan Bond first took an interest in the gold fields 
and decided to start buying up key leases on the Golden Mile, with the idea of removing the surface workings and creating a large open-cut mine. He was not the first to have this idea, but he was the first to actually set about doing it. Many of the leaseholders were reluctant to sell, and some saw a good chance of making a big windfall from their sale. The last holdout was Poseidon, which eventually sold out to Bond for a sum reported to be around $375 million. Bond had gambled on the gold price remaining high, and although he achieved his ambition of amalgamating the Golden Mile leases, he had paid too high a price. By 1989, he was looking for a buyer, and Poseidon was waiting in the wings. The super pit that exists today produces gold ore of very low quality, but because modern extraction methods are very effective and gold prices remain high, it manages to make a very healthy profit. It was first opened in 1989 and since then has produced well over 50 million ounces of gold. It takes about seven loads of ore in a haul pack truck to produce two ounces of gold. Kalgoorlie is located in the world's largest electorate, which goes all the way north to Newman. Kalgoorlie was first proclaimed in 1895 and Boulder in 1897. Boulder got its name from George Brookman, who named his mining lease the Great Boulder after a small mine he had worked in Dashwoods Gully, South Australia. Boulder, which lies five kilometres south of Kalgoorlie, is now incorporated into the main settlement, and it is administered as one entity. Boulder was originally surveyed in 1896, and within a few years there were no fewer than 34 hotels servicing the population. Alexander MacDonald, a Scottish writer, wrote in his book In Search of El Dorado, When my party stepped from the train in Kalgoorlie, we saw before us a scattered array of wooden and galvanised iron houses. In the near distance, we could see the towering poppet heads, widely known as the Great Boulder Mine, and the din created by the revolving hammers and the ever-active stamping machinery assailed our ears with an indescribable uproar. But beyond the dust and smoke of these nature-combating engines of civilization, the open desert dotted with its stunted mulga and mallee growths, shimmered back into the horizon. An early bard once penned of Boulder, rather rowdy, dingy, cloudy, dusty, dirty, dim and dowdy, thirsty throats to mock, can't mistake her, great drought slaker, six pubs to the blooming acre, that's the Boulder block. One seemingly forgotten event happened in April 2010 when Kalgoorlie was rocked by a magnitude 5 earthquake. It damaged some buildings, caused some streets to be evacuated and temporarily stopped work at the super pit. 